invite you to join me in singing our hymn, Were You There When They Crucified My Lord? We'll sing it in three parts throughout the service. This is an African-American spiritual. Um, it has been then passed down in many different traditions, hymnals, um, but that's the origin. And so we will sing it with the reverence with which that tradition deserves and demands. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? This is a love, <clears throat> part one. This is a love that hushed a crowd. This is a love that broke bread, broke chains, broke into history. This is a love that walked a lonely road. This is a love that drove Pilate mad. This is a love abandoned, tortured. This is a love that wept and wailed. This is a love that suffered with other love. This is a love that died. This is a love that was executed. Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Were you there when the sun refused to shine? Were you there when the sun refused to shine? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when the sun refused to shine? This is a love laid in a grave. 
This is a love that would not let go. This is a love that rolled back the stone. This is a love that would not let go. This is a love that astonished the women in the morning. This is a love that would not let go. Were you there when they rolled the stone away? Were you there when they rolled the stone away? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they rolled the stone away? Were you there when he rose up from the dead? Were you there when he rose up from the dead? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when he rose up from the dead? Our reading this morning comes to us from the gospel according to Mark, the resurrection of Jesus. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? And when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side. And they were alarmed, but he, he said to them, be not afraid. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. Now, after he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went out and told those who had been with him while they were mourning and weeping. But when they heard he was alive and had been seen by her, they would not believe it. Can I ask y'all a favor on this Easter morning? Well, some of you, if you're comfortable, turn your cameras on because I have my screen on gallery view and I would like to look at you. The old story goes that the three women went to Jesus's tomb two days after he was crucified and buried. They went to anoint the body of their teacher and friend who had been executed by the state 
the one who had sat with those on the fringes of society, the one who had flipped the tables and preached in that old Jewish tradition of prophecy about the upside down kingdom of God, where those who are downtrodden and oppressed shall be lifted up and those who are mighty shall be brought low. And when they arrived, they found not the death they were expecting, but a tomb that was empty and they would not believe it. Would you? How could they when they lived in such a time of crucifixion, a time of state sanctioned torture and murder and punishment, a time like ours with our state sanctioned torture and murder and punishment? hate crimes against Asian Americans on the rise, migrant children still separated from their parents in cages at the border, not just under the Trump administration. Half a million people dead in the US alone, the vaccine still patented and therefore hoarded police brutality against black people and non-black people on occasion, the abandonment of the most vulnerable, the disregard for parents and children with the burdens falling largely on working mothers bills attempting to outlaw gender affirming medical care for transgender teenagers. Indeed, we also live in a time of crucifixion. And how exhausted must those women have been tending to the broken body of their teacher and their friend, mired in their own grief. Have you been there? Have you struggled for a better world for years, for yourself and for your children to have your heart broken again and again, or worse, calloused, your hope stolen from you? Have you shut up your hopes for a better world in the tomb because it's become too hard to believe that another world is possible? Have you gotten up not just one morning, but sunrise after sunrise to care and tend struggling through the muck of your own sorrow? Have you been worn thin by it? Sorrow for those you love in your life, sorrow for the world. Have you made a cloak of your sorrow? Has it settled over your skin like a film? Though miserable, it can feel safe in there. Be not afraid, says the young man to the bewildered women at dawn. Though there is much to fear, though there are so many reasons to check and double check, though everyone would understand if they sat down in the dirt, numb, motionless, bereft. Though we live in a time of crucifixion, be not afraid. Be not afraid? Try telling that to my amygdala. Try telling that to the part of my brain that keeps me safe, especially when there is so much to fear. Now, perhaps this young man in first century Palestine did not understand how the amygdala works, but we do. We understand that deep within our temporal lobes are located these little almond shaped clusters of nuclei called the amygdalae, and they are responsible for our fear response, among other things. Perhaps you have heard the phrase creature brain or reptile brain. This is the part of the brain that works to keep us alive. This is the part of the brain that controls our anxiety, our reactivity, our threat response, our fight, flight, freeze, and appease response. It is not conscious. Though our conscious minds can gently notice its response and practice other ways of being. But in times of crucifixion, the amygdala works overtime to keep you off the cross and out of harm's way. It is not only the writer of the gospel according to Mark who offers such instruction, but also the poet, the poet Mary Oliver and her poem, Don't Hesitate. If you suddenly and unexpectedly feel joy, don't hesitate. Give in to it. There are plenty of lives and whole towns destroyed or about to be. We are not wise and not very often kind and much can never be redeemed. Still life has some possibility left. Perhaps this is its way of fighting back, but sometimes something happened better than all the riches or power in the world. It could be anything, but very likely you notice it in the instant when love begins. 
Anyway, that's often the case. Anyway, whatever it is, don't be afraid of its plenty. Joy is not made to be a crumb. In our conversation about the scripture commonly read on Easter this morning, Marie Hawk and I were talking earlier this week about that phrase, do not be afraid. And it is particularly unhelpful to hear, um, especially when you hear it like an order from an authority figure, which is how it sounds to my ear at first. You know, do not be afraid or else. But what if instead we hear it like a spell or like a mantra rather than an instruction we dutifully obey or else fail to obey and risk punishment? What if instead this instruction is whispered in your ear by a beloved friend or maybe just the wind protecting you and giving you courage? Do not be afraid. What if instead of telling you your feelings are wrong, this instruction keeps you company? You don't have to be ruled by fear, says the man at the tomb, says the angel, says the friend, the one who whispers in the twilight, and you're not even sure if you heard it right or if it was only the wind. There is a hope that cannot be killed. There is mercy in every morning. You do not have to be afraid of joy, of the possibility of something new. And the amygdala plays a role in the size and complexity of our social networks too. It's responsible among other things for facial recognition. Since we've been wearing masks for a year, I wonder about the reactions of our amygdala, the information they've been missing to do that crucial part of their job. I don't know, so I won't speculate. I'll leave that to the neuroscientists. I will only observe that this part of the brain so often cited as the space where we process fear is also involved in strengthening our social networks and in inviting us to turn toward one another once again. Perhaps there is no real way to ensure that you stay safe, that you stay off the cross in times of crucifixion, other than to turn toward one another again and again and tear down all the crosses in the world. You can imagine that the people at the Center for, for Disease Control may feel like the women at the tomb, trying to tell the rest of us the good news, that the vaccines are here, that they're safe, that they're effective, and how many of us are the disciples who do not believe. And I don't mean those who deny that COVID is real, I mean those of us wondering to ourselves, I know I'm safe or safe-ish, or soon I will be safe, but when will I start to believe it? When will I start to feel like I can emerge from this tomb? Of course, there is no life without some risk. The only place without risk is the grave. In the story, the news that Jesus has risen from the dead was greeted with terror and amazement, not joyous proclamation. And for us in these times of vaccines and variants of nicer weather and possible experiments in our own church community, the possibility of winning federal relief for normal people at a scale not seen in almost a century and a wide, wide range of comfort among us within the CDC guidelines. What we thought might bring us triumph actually brings us some tenderness and some terror too. Some of us are dreaming about what our lives would be like if our student loans were forgiven. Some of us are dreaming about what our lives would be like if we worked $15 minimum wage or a $24 minimum wage if you're keeping up with inflation. Some of us are dreaming about hugging our friends again, about working without children interrupting us again, about life without the threat of death hanging over us again, about receiving visitors to our retirement communities and seeing their full faces again. It is almost too much to be hopeful for. Some of us are afraid to hope, afraid to believe, afraid to be crushed again. We take in the facts as best we can. Things are changing. This tomb is empty, and yet we stumble around in terror and amazement. Perhaps that's the process here. Study the facts as best you can. And when you are ready, 
listen for that whisper in your ear, the voice of the wind or of an angel or of an ancestor or of the movements rising and gaining steam around us. You do not have to be afraid. The time will come, maybe even soon, where we will be able to look in each other's faces in person once more. The time will come and maybe even soon where we will see the world where everyone is free. A fully vaccinated friend came to my house last week and she walked in the door and I hugged her and she burst into tears on the spot. We are easing in to being together again. We are cautiously easing into the news that perhaps Easter is here after all. That's the good news about good news. It arrives and waits for us to receive it. May it be so for you and so for us all. Amen. <laughs>